sclerosis and I will uh, destabilize the case. So you need to uh, uh, be ready to convert the case vitrectomy. And uh, the third situation what I usually come across is not a very good case for buckle, but you don't have much choice to do other than the buckle. So especially in case of uh, children where there is uh, sickness and no PVD and uh, FEVR, sometimes a retroblastoma with uh, detachment need to be done with a buckle. And very rarely, sometimes the inferior traction is not relieved by the vitrectomy, even with the retinal relaxing retinotomy, you might have to go with the clearal buckle. So, any, uh, till you master the surgery, I would like you to suggest uh, to go for a general anesthesia in order to prevent or avoid the apprehension of both the surgeon and the patient. So, you might be anticipating some surprises on the table, like conjunctival scars, lebectasia, spiral sections, cataract sections, etc. Visualization, again, do not have much compromise. You have to be very perfect with your indirect ophthalmoscopy. Again, I took a photo of Dr. Padmacha doing her indirect. So. And you can get away with a microscope or even a loop. And the latest gadget has come with a Chandler buckle surgery. Uh, Regarding the conjunctival opening, about uh, two to three millimeter away from the limbus is a very good uh, delineation of the tissue between the tenons and the sphere where you can have a less bleeding and messy to begin with the surgery itself. One need to really familiarize with the oblix and recti insertion to avoid the tagging between the two, especially the superior rectus and the lateral rectus. You can on the table expect say, extensive scleral ecclesia where you might have to convert to the vitrectomy on the but as a buckle surgeon, I would like to uh, tell that it, you need to respect the vertex frame for you to survive to avoid any devastating complication. Keep your eyes and ears open to hear the beeping sound from the monitor, especially to look for the oculocardiac reflex, which may manifest as a simple as bradycardia, which are manageable, or it can sometimes lead to a rarest of rarest life threatening cardiac arrest on table also which is usually caused by the traction of the muscles. So the need to come out of the globe area, avoid any pressure, give some local, and try to deepen the anesthesia with the help of your anesthetist. As far as the localization is concerned, the important tips, what I feel is that the lateral marking and the posterior marking makes you uh, clear on the sera to decide which type of buckle you need to be placed, and always mark it from the muscle insertion. Take a lot of anatomical clues from the eyeball, especially the vertex veins, which has got a fixed uh, locations and the, the, uh, the clock hours to maintain. And you can also look into the other eye lesions in order to anticipate which are the lesions on the off retina you are trying to miss. Uh, as far as the error of parallax, uh, has been always taught and taught, and uh, I think any of the surgeon would have had at least one inadvertent cryo reaction rather than the anticipated in their surgical career and one has to be really careful about this so try to avoid defrosting the lid and try to avoid rapid removal of the probe before defrosting you can as well get away with some of the laser and say barrage on the attached retina lesions in order to avoid a heavy cryo to avoid the post-operative inflammation as well the globe and the, the needle is actually convex to each other on the opposite side. So you need to flatten the globe when you take the sutures so that the spheral entry and the depth is uniform when you have this. You might have to modify a lot of uh, changes on during the suturing, especially when you have to take a continuous bite rather than the uh, bit bite, especially when the globe is, uh, I mean, the orbit is shallow. And you have a lot of modifications to do with that. You can take a vertical mattress or a horizontal mattress, which depends on the location of the brain and uh, the situation. As far as the SRF drainage is concerned, try to avoid any area near the vortex wing because a lot of vessels transmit at that area and to avoid any puncturing of the vessel and the huge uh, uh, hemorrhages. So either of the two, Cut technique or the needle drainage has got its own charm of the surgical procedure of drainage. But however, after the drainage, one need to control the IOP by holding the muscles tightly till you inject some saline into the vitreous cavity or the air. And the low IOP at this point of time, you need to be careful about the coronal detachment or supracoronal hemorrhage, subretinal hemorrhage, etc. The high IOP at this point of time again can lead to retinal incarcerations. One has to be near.
there are two panic buttons which I feel to be understood. So one is the dry tap of the sudden loss, and second one is the vitreous loss. The dry tap, you need to just stop the procedure, see the indirect. If the fluid is uh, still there, you might think that it might be an inadequate perforation. If there are no fluid, you can have a shifting fluid from there, and retinal incarceration has to be managed accordingly. Vitreous loss, you need to look for the iatrogenic break, excise the vitreous prolapse, close the area, cryo it, and support the buckle if it is outside the buckle bed. Fish mouthing is one of the very common uh, situation we come across. It can be due to too good or a too high buckle effect in cases of a large HSTs. Try to readjust the buckle by relaxing the sutures. You can inject some saline to iron out the fish mouth uh, anti edges or try to add a radial element beneath the bucket. So the final touches, once before closing, you need to check for the optic disc. There's no bleed, no drainage side complications. You have to titrate the IOP by doing either paracentesis or some injection to the vitreous cavity. Beware of too high buckle effect you give because it can have its own long-term implications like bleeding, intrusions, and uh, anti well. One has to be really good with the meticulous conjunctival closure, especially uh, in two layer to avoid any sutural exposure or the button. So the key points for my keynote would be that try to choose an appropriate case for the buckle. Prepare and plan a strategy a day before you plan the surgery and execute it with more confidence within your comfort zone. And the most crucial step which I would like from my perspective would be to have a good localization and final securing so that the sutures do not snap at the end of your surgery and a good drainage. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pradeep. For those the most essential tips in still bubble. So we'll discuss actually top tips from our vice council in the the summary. So now we'll let us move forward to stepwise learning of FD art. So during this talk, we'll take an audience questions. Right now, the floating mics can be used for your questions and uh, definitely to be answered by our vice council as well as eminent speakers. The first topic is to understand why buckle is preferred over uh, Vitrectomy by Dr. Abhishek Kotari. Thank you so much, uh, VRSI, for giving me this opportunity and uh, uh, thank you for being here this morning. About 30 years back, in a similar conference, the topic might have been when vitrectomy is preferred over bucking. And you know, times have changed now, vitrectomy is uh, considered as, uh, as a, I would say, a more promising modality. But still, buckle has a place. So let's look at what, uh, where all buckle is, uh, you know, better at uh, fixing the retina and giving you better results. A host of case studies starting from about 50 cases to the uh, meta-analysis that have compared almost 17, 18,000 cases. They come to the conclusion that for simple uh, reg RDs, better initial visual acuity and lesser intraocular complications are observed with scleral buckling. Whereas for complicated reg RDs, better reattachment rates and fewer choroidal complications at a slightly higher cost come with PPV. So what are these simple reg RDs where we should be considering only a buckle? Now I'll distribute this talk uh, by the components of RD. These are the components of the RD that uh, help us decide on how to uh, you know, choose the perfect thing. So since break is the cause of and the most important thing to be fixed in an RD, let's start with the break. Most, uh, uh, most breaks are less than one clock R in size and these are ideal for buckling. Usually breaks that are bigger have a higher chance of fish mouthing and uh, uh, other complications. The number of breaks in almost 60% of cases there are more than one breaks and if they are in one quadrant you can still manage to uh, do a buckle. Even if they are in multiple quadrants you can sometimes do multiple buckles though this is now uh, you know not the usual trend. It used to be a dictum that if on, uh, in the clinic you can depress a break, it is uh, bucklable. However, with radial sponges, you can actually reach much farther behind and you can be a little liberal with this uh, guideline. There are certain situations where the break is not identified. However, here, link off rule, as will be told in a subsequent talk, can still identify the most probable location and can be buckled. Coming to the next component, that is SRF. Now, we have to realize that retinal detachment surgery is surgery of the break, not of the retinal detachment per se. 
therefore the approach to the both the cases uh, case scenarios where it's a, one is a subtotal rd and one is a small localized attachment is going to be the same the bullish nature can sometimes lead to uh, miss uh, 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 diagnosis or sometimes you may not be able to find a break or due to parallax may mislocate a break however these are uh, can easily overcomable by practice chronicity usually does not uh, you know le lead you to decide whether you are going to go for a buckle or a rd uh, or a Little buckling or a vitrectomy because both approaches are almost the same. Coming to the next factor, that is the detached retina. The most important component here is PVR, and most studies have shown that if you have a grade of C or more, that is more than B, then vitrectomy is favored over skull buckling. However, if you have early PVR, then uh, you can use either approach, and even in uh, if the Grade C uh, PVR is away from the break and is uh, you know not really impacting on the macula. You can still use buckling effectively. Macula hole and ERMs are present in about two to eight percent of cases, and here we uh, prefer the internal approach rather than the external approach. And uh, uh, the media is uh, important in a young patient with a clear lens or with a very early cataract. You can still go ahead with the buckling without causing uh, cataractogenesis or uh, needing cataract surgery. In cases of pseudophagia, if the peripheral capsular status and uh, the posterior capsule is intact, then again, buckle is a great option. A fakia, uh, you can still do a buckling. Only thing is paracentesis and air injection needs to be avoided. Preoperative hemorrhage, if it does not impair your view of the retina and the breaks, buckling is uh, equivalent to uh, fast plan of vitrectomy and there's no higher rate of PVR as uh, thought earlier. Visualization of the breaks is key and sometimes you can also use ambulatory patching to uh, settle the blood. Choroidal detachment uh, and hypotony are high risk factors for PVR and postoperative failure with buckle. So here uh, uh, internal approach that is vitrectomy is favored. Uh, also if you have uh, a scleral thinning in the region of the break then you may want to, this is again a relative contraindication but you may want to avoid scleral buckling. Similar with conjunctival issues. Most important is the surgeon factor. Now. A lot of uh, people may not be as good as uh, uh, everybody else on indirect ophthalmoscopy and may not be exposed to scleral buckling techniques during their uh, residency. This is usually a contraindication. If you're not very comfortable with the buckling, then you uh, may avoid it. Also, your initial experience dictates how you think and approach RDs. There is a very nice uh, paper by Dr. Didier Dukornau, which has uh, shown that, you know, there is a difference between the surgeon personality. There are certain types of people who would prefer to buckle and certain types of people who would go for vitrectomy. So I've just concluded in this one slide. So these are almost absolute contraindications of uh, buckling. These are relative contraindications. So if any of these is not present, then scleral buckling is the preferred way to go. If these are present, then pass plan vitrectomy is the way to go. And on top of that, there is the uh, surgeon factor or training in SP which will decide which one will be better in your hands. Thank you. Definitely you said that the training is probably this kind of workshops will mitigate that need and uh, uh, Dr. Muthinja has also joined online. So I was just asking what's your absolute indication to perform buckle instead of vitrectomy? I don't know. Um, thank you for having me. I hope you can hear me. Um, I think that a, a great buckle candidate would be a fake young patient with um, you know, a, a reachable tear, does not have PVR or high risk features, that I think a buckle can settle that problem quite easily. Um, I like buckles for uh, retinal dialyses. Um, I like buckles in kids. You can turn on your video. Sure. Um, that might make it worse. Hello, everyone. Um, and I think buckles um, in children, specifically where there's no separation of the hyaloid at that time, um, I think is a great way to stage a procedure. And I think these days, um, either you can be definitive. <laughs> able to hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So I think those uh, are, are, to me, not absolutes, but those are scenarios that I teach my fellows to at least consider 
doing a, a scleral buckle as a primary procedure uh, first up. I, I think you know the, the speakers have made a really good point. It's not that buckling is right or wrong. It's often just not thought of as as a first option anymore. I think that vitrectomy becomes um, you know the go to when actually buckling can be a, a very uh, positive and uh, successful way to address the problem. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mithunja. I think we will move forward to the next. Uh, how and when, what to localize the device. So we all know that the localization is uh, probably half the surgery done. I think the mic is not working. So thank you uh, to the scientific committee for this opportunity. And I'm going to take up, since it's a green hall session, taking a very, very basic talk on localization, which we know is one of the most important steps in level buckling. So why is it important? The entire success of the surgery depends on accurate localization of the break. Only if we correctly localize can we treat and support the break. How to localize? Some important tips. A thorough binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy is a must. And when we do this, it's important to uh, mark the extent and the borders of the detachment, especially the superior borders. This is because those borders of the detachment are going to give us the cue about the location of the primary break. What is the primary break? The primary break is the one which alone can cause the configuration of the detachment as we see it. We have to concentrate on searching for the primary break and then we apply the rules of how to find the primary break. And uh, Dr. Linkoff has given these beautiful uh, tools and uh, tools for us to kind of look for this. So when we look at the RD and we kind of localize it, if it's a superior temporal or a nasal detachment, just look in this area where it's marked in a black triangle. 98% of the time, the break is going to be located here. If it's a total or superior RD which crosses the 12 o'clock meridian, just look around 12 o'clock. 93% of the time, the break is going to be present in the superior part. If it's an inferior detachment, the whole scenario changes. If it's an inferior detachment which is not bullous, then you have to look at the edge which is higher. And in 95% of the cases, you're going to find a break in this segment. If it's an inferior bullous detachment, so the moment it is bullous, the clue is that something is sticking from the top. So then you have to look and look for a superior break. And normally the area of the break will be where the bulla is higher. So these are very, very simple rules. If we follow these, most of the time you're going to find the break. What are we localizing? We are looking, looking for horseshoe tears, holes, lattices with holes, and dialysis. When we are doing the procedure practically as a beginner, what are we supposed to mark? So if there's a very small tear or small hole, you just need to mark the posterior edge. That one mark is enough. But if it's a large tear, large flap, mark the center of the posterior edge and mark the horns of the break itself. If you have a lot of breaks or lattices together, you can kind of club them together and mark the lateral edges and along with the posterior most edge. This is very important because posteriorly the extent of the buckle, the buckle you choose will depend on how posterior this is. In cases of dialysis, you can mark the lateral ends and the posterior mode portion. I think Dr. Pradeep also brought this up. If there's a bullous detachment because of parallax, we tend to localize it more posterior. So the tip for beginners is that you start from the ora anteriorly and then you depress posteriorly. So this will help us avoid doing this, getting this parallax to a large extent. So this is just a short video in which you can see. So the recti tag, we, are, we, have, we have kind of localized the break, we have marked it with our forceps. We confirm it again. I'm not showing that for lack of time, but again, you're going to kind of confirm it. Again, go back to the indirect. And once you are sure where it is, you can use either this tension violet pen or you can use a pottery to kind of mark it and confirm it. What to use? You can use forceps. Some people use a cryo probe. They do diagnostic freezing of suspicious areas, but do it in a very limited manner. Localizers like oak runners, gas, and chrysic are also available for, to use. So to conclude, I think this is probably the most important step on on basis of this step, the rest of the success of your rest of your procedure is going to hinge. Good in, uh, binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy and drawing a good answer chart like Dr. Uh, PDS showed right in the beginning. 
This is a must, especially for beginners, for your buckle uh, to succeed. And only if we localize well can we treat accurately and correctly. Thank you so much. Great talk, uh, Darais. I think localization is the key for SBR, and accurate treatment is actually half surgery done. So, Dr. Chandran Abhinav, sir, your tips for learners to master the art of localization. I think. Uh, um... I think Darius, you have mentioned all the methods of localization. I think if I can talk about the previous speaker and what he said about Leapfrog's rule, Asad and others have published recently that it works in 79% of the cases and in eyes where the brakes are active. The brakes are posterior or if uh, you have a attached vitreous, they probably. And I think other things have been covered, and uh, I think the assistant should not drag the retractor from side to side. You will have to change the position of the retractor, the retractor taken out, put in the new place. If you drag, you are likely to damage the whole next. Thank you, sir. I think uh, that's very important. And next topic is how and what to localize. Yeah, money only. I'm going to. Sorry, sir. <laughs> so it, it, it just shows that I'm the first time moderator. <laughs> so, so select. In the meantime, uh, if I may add, uh, just a question about localization. I think it begins with uh, your, uh, you know, in the OPD every day for beginners doing indirect ophthalmoscopy regularly, especially for myopes, and uh, learn the art of clear depression. I think that is the best preparation for scared buckets. To be well versed with that, I think people think about it as a specialized skill. I think it's a basic skill. Can I add one thing? <clears throat> the pre-op session is a uh, very different for a beginner. In the operating theatre session, where the drapes, the endotracheal tube, your own mask and gown and gloves, and uh, the cornea, which is not that clear. So the situations are different. So the beginner should be able to be prepared for this and slowly try to overcome these. Things. <laughs> So I will actually um, thank you for the opportunity and select what to book and which watch. So just we will uh, see some case scenarios. So this is a 24 year old male, baby, one eye. And you can see that uh, there is a been a blazer barrage has been done. And uh, the actual primary base is actually uh, localized pylon from Bora, which is actually the anterior break. And now what we have chosen is a 287 buckle, which is our at least 7 mm width and the post op you can see that the laser uh, barrage is the break is rising on the bubble. So here the thing is that the important point is location of primary break is important and uh, convex buckle can be preferred over fractional component and posterior laser marriage, uh, barrage marks are not a contraindication to perform the buckle. Now let us look at the second scenario. This is an 18 year old female. One night, fake it, high menu, and you can see that right eye already has a spot in the attachment, and left eye is having a shallow retinal detachment. In fact, OCT can show you very clearly the extent of detachment. And here, I've chosen a 276 and uh, buckle in inferior two quadrants. Suspicious areas were clear because there was no clear cut break that was seen, and SRF drained. And uh, you can see the post of retinal detachment. So, the point. Here is that no visible break is not a contraindication. 
in an 18 year old where you think expect a high light posterior attachment end to end bubble with suspicious area coverage can solve the problem and can should be tried as a primary surgery. This is the third scenario where 25 year old male you can see multiple breaks in one quadrant. So, and localization, they are all 5 mm from ORA. Choose in a 287, again, suspecting some traction component. So, a convex buckle like 287 was chosen. And uh, you can see that uh, retinal attachment. So, multiple breaks are not a contraindication. Actual localization of posterior margin of posterior break is what is uh, the important. And let us look at this scenario 49 year old male, fake it. And the break is uh, the lattice, which is a location 7 mm from ORA. So, choose an A279. So, it's a 7 mm. So, you have to choose a 279. And uh, you can uh, see. So, the break localized uh, actually here underneath the muzzle. So, one suture was placed on either side of the muzzle to have equal effect. So, 7 mm bit buckle. So, posterior bite, you will take 9 mm from ORA. 9 mm bit buckle. Posterior bite, 11 mm. And 10 mm bit buckle, which is occasionally can be done. So, posterior by 2 mm from ORA. So, this is a uh, uh, lady fake patient and you can see that there was a shallow retinal detachment and was one year delayed with visual evocated potentials and fields thinking some neurologic problem without examining the fundus. So, the multiple lattices in three quadrants, posterior lattice localization was 5 mm from ORA. So, taken 287 uh, style buckle, three quadrants, all lattices cleared, SRF trained. And just examine that there is a under examination. We also found that actually right eye also had a, because she was not cooperate initially. So right eye also had a lattice with detachment in the inferotemporal quadrant. So accurate indirect ophthalmoscopy of retinal periphery of affected as well as the fellow eye is must. Multiple breaks in multiple quadrants is not a contraindication. So in a buckle suitable RD, it is a four quadrant and eight sutures is all required to place one buckle. We need not place different, different buckles. So, it is all that required. So, the in indicated case, that is what is important. So, this is a case scenario of high myope, 31 year old fake And you can see the break. And then when we localize, it is 8 mm from ORA, non-drainage, shallow detachment. And here uh, placed a 280 style buckle. And uh, so, the actual localization of posterior margin of the break is what is important. Morphology of RD, understanding posterior vitreous detachment status, chronicity of RD, subretinal PVR changes like demarcation lines, intraretinal stages, buckle is the choice. And 24 year old fake it. So, here it was a very shallow detachment. In fact, the OCT was actually able to tell you the actual extent of detachment. And uh, here uh, again, suspicious dialysis area and SNQ non drainage. And you can see that uh, no visible break is not a contraindication. And link of rule, sometimes it definitely helps you because it's a superior temporal, it can help you to know the causative break. And OCT can actually uh, accurately identify the extent of detachment as well as the post op recovery. And then 52 year old fake uh, uh, scleral thinning, but the actual break, there was no thinning area, and which was just 3 mm per hour. So, here a 4 mm 42 band was chosen, drainage, and you can see that, uh, you know, retinal attached very well. So, extreme scleral technique, careful suturing need to be done. Tunnels cannot be placed to the secure the buckle of choice. Thank you. So, uh, Gopal and uh, Salafina, like, in, what is any additional thing in that? Uh, you showed all the cases. Uh... Uh, you've chosen a buckle, uh, a tire, and an encerclage. Oh. But I think uh, you missed uh, the sponges. At least I prefer sponges. Many of the situations you've shown, I would have gone ahead with only a segmental sponge, and uh, you would have done, you know, lesser surgery to uh, settle that retina. Like, no, what is the preference of others? I, I you know what? I think that's a that's an excellent point because if we believe Linkoff, which we all do, just putting an element exactly where the pathology is is enough. I think though that for um, the the current generation that find buckling uncomfortable to begin with, the lack of a broad area of support, you know, supporting the vitreous space, etc., 
makes a focal sponge that would take care of the entire job even more uncomfortable. But I think that's actually quite brilliant, and it eliminates some of the the um, controversy over buckling in terms of inducing myopia and um, and diplopia, et cetera. If you can just find a very straightforward area to imbricate um, with a focal sponge, you're, you, you'll be done. Um, it's actually quite quite nice. But I, I think more head, more scary because it's so simple. So I would also say that simple break, simple tear, one sponge right on the tear, that would be fine. But we tend to manage the fluid, the pressure, the support. If there is any, if we are developing that area, we would like to support. So all that would require a certain function. So finally, it all depends on the case. And if it's a simple segmental retinal detachment with one tear and one small sponge in that area, would just settle. But if it's a little more than that, which in which we may now move towards retracting more than buckle, but if you are buckling it, then I think a certain function element is very much. I think once it is there in your armamentarium, you tend to use definitely wherever it is indicated. And sponges, I think it's probably again, I think it's all comes with the training. So if you are exposed to putting sponges during your training period, you tend to use that. So that's why I think this all efforts. Yeah, so we also did a lot of sponges earlier, but we've kind of moved away from sponges because of the infection issues. That is one thing to be kept in mind. And the same thing can very easily also be done with just a small segment of, you know, you can just cut a little bit of the, uh, your 276, you're putting that, just cover the bone. So you're taking away the infection issue and you're taking away the exclusion issue and you're achieving the same results. And circular also we kind of tend to do because the same thing we'd like to cover. Uh, breaks that can come sequentially, very rarely though, but yes. And uh, yeah, point well taken, it's all through your yes. training. So, historically we used to put a gelatin implant between the solid silicon and the stable bed. That will serve post-operatively and have a temporary increase. I have a question, what do you all do? When you find a break or lattice and attach it, we just use the prior and leave them out. Yeah. I think we just Any do. Any others do anything else? In fact, attached retina probably we lattice, the laser, laser uh, photocognition is preferable to reduce the reaction as well. So we will move forward to an important step uh, that is uh, critical for success of scleral buckle surgery. Uh, that is SRF drainage techniques by Dr. Prithvi Mathenjia. I'll just share my screen. I, I... Can I share my screen? Yeah. We have your talk uploaded as well. Shall we do that? Uh, whatever is easier, that's fine. Yeah. Will have yeah, to now we, yeah, we can see your slides and your audible as well. Okay, so someone will have to advance me. I wanted to thank the organizers for uh, allowing me to be a part. I feel very bad not to be there in person, especially with all of my close colleagues and friends. Um, if we can advance the slides. I don't have control. Thank you. These are my disclosures, none of which are pertinent. Next. So why train subretinal fluid? You'll have to advance the slides, please. Next. So the goal is reapposition of the neurosensory retina to the retinal pigment epithelium. Next. So the, this is done because the break cannot be opposed to the RPE with a spiral buckle alone. Sometimes the chronicity of the subretinal fluid becomes very thick and you don't feel that it will drain or get pumped back by the RPE alone. You may want to reduce the height of the uh, retinal detachment in order to gain access into the eye or for uh, proper apposition or cryo. Uh, sometimes you want to avoid putting a expansile bubble due to travel uh, issues for the patient or positioning concerns. And sometimes you just want to have the retina completely reattached at the end of the case. 
And that can be, um, you know, for the surgeon, very uh, satisfying as well. Next slides. <clears throat> So there's two main approaches to, um, to drainage. And if you have a schematic here of a retinal detachment, next please. You can enter through the pars plana, we can advance, through um, the pars plana, through the vitreous, and transrectally. And this is typically done through a vitrectomy approach, uh, either with a drainage retinotomy, retinectomy, or uh, draining through an existing break. Next. Or you can take an external approach through the sclera, next please, um, which is transscleral, transcoroidal, which becomes an important consideration, and then into the subretinal space, where we can use an external needle scleral cut down, and often it's combined with scleral button. Next please. The goal is to reduce or eliminate the subretinal fluid, and why don't, continue? Thanks, sorry about this. Yeah, why don't we drain routinely, next please? Because we fear things. We fear puncturing the neurosensory retina. We fear subretinal hemorrhage. We fear hypotony with secondary coital detachment. And we are often very comfortable with internal drainage or vitrectomy, as we discussed with scleral buckling in general. Next, please. So the key is the unfamiliarity with the procedure, the difficulty um, that we have in visualization, and the perception that we have on the following either that this is an uncontrolled process or unsafe. Next, please. There are different approaches to external drain. The first is the de-ACE technique that was um, uh, popularized by McLeod um, in the 80s, in which you first drain the subretinal fluid, fill the eye with air, cry out the break, and then encircle. Um, often visualization under air is difficult, so this has often um, been abandoned. Next. The scleral cutdown method is one that's still popularly used, in which a blade is used to enter the um, through the sclera to the edge of the choroid. Diaphragm can be used, or a needle can be used to enter the subretinal space. Or finally, next, needle drainage, um, either with a suture needle blade penetration, or next, um, using a uh, direct visualization of the needle. Next, please. Here's an example if you can play the video of a 13-month-old with leukocoria that we believe was uh, due to Coates disease, no signs of a mass was noted. Here, we're trying to drain externally, so we place um, an infusion into the anterior chamber that induces elevation of pressure. We make a scleral cut down, and as we go through the choroid, we can see the copious yellow material uh, coming out, which is the subretinal fluid with the proteinaceous material. This is a scleral cut down technique that then allows or flattening of the retina, and then direct treatment of the pathology. Next, needle control drainage um, uses a modified technique um, that I was taught by um, my teachers. First, is to localize the retinal break and treat them, encircle uh, with the eye, and tighten the band. I will use a 26 gauge needle on a syringe uh, where I can use the, the shaft for depression. I use the bevel away from the sclera and within the, uh, the bed of the buckle, a perpendicular entry is made and that allows for um, direct observation with um, an indirect ophthalmoscope um, and drainage of fluid. The caveat to this is that you need to have the band tightened. You want your visualization may be limited due to the uh, cornea at that time. And you want to watch for the fluttering of the retina overlying the needle that indicates uh, of the vortex of the fluid coming out of the needle itself. Next, please. Modifications of the needle can be used for safety. Here are two examples of placing a sheet. Um, the lower example recently published uses the number 70 sleeve on the edge of a 26 gauge needle to allow for depth control to avoid um, a deep pass. Um, the EDD is produced by Vortex Surgical um, that allows for a shaft for scleral depression, and then a small um, lever to advance the needle um, once it's in position, so a much more controlled manner of, um, of evacuation of the subretinal fluid. Next, please, just have a couple more slides. Visualization is the hardest part of this procedure. Indirect ophthalmoscopy can be a challenge because the eye is often turned, the needle has to be held in place under the buckle. The corneal view can be compromised, and it's often late in the case, 
And as you tighten the buckle, you have to elevate the intraocular pressure, which can make the cornea become cloudy. And the needle can often slip out from its position. It can be hard to see. Um, next, please. Um, and there have been uh, numerous examples published um, by our colleagues in India that um, have shown modifications of these techniques that can help that process. And then finally, the chandelier buckling um, can also be helpful. Next slide. That shows us um, an ability to uh, directly visualize. Uh, here's a primary phagic retinal detachment, mainly inferior, macula off. So we place the band, we use the 26 gate needle within the base of the buckle. We have the chandelier light in place. We're entering with the needle and we can see the needle directly with the wide field viewing system. The key is as the, the detachment is coming down slowly, over the tip of the needle, you'll see a fluttering of the retina. That's actually quite satisfying because then you know you're almost done. But the key is don't pull out just then. Just wait a little bit and then you can um, remove and you'll have to close that sclerotomy. Next slide. So there's six tips for optimized subretinal fluid drainage. The first, <clears throat> next please. Place uh, the chandelier placement is critical. Place it about uh, 90 to 180 degrees away from the detachment. Uh, make sure it's not going to get in the way of the biome device. Uh, valve cannulas are important uh, because then you avoid having an opening uh, where vitreous can egress. Adjust your biome and viewing system so it doesn't knock into where your needle is going. Optimize your corneal view. Slide that needle under the buckle outside of the scope and then go under the scope to then advance your needle. Next, please. Don't allow the microscope to push your needle um, or your syringe out. And finally, next, um, be controlled. You want to, you want to control re-entry into the subretinal space and you want to watch the optic nerve head perfusion as the, as the uh, band is being tightened. Last slide. So some parting thoughts. It's very hard to teach traditional uh, needle drainage. Fellows can't often see the internal drainage while you're doing it if you're the, the chief surgeon. So the, the chandelier uh, effect can be helpful. Um, you want to have good stabilization of the globe and the needle. And um, if you don't do it, in the word of in the words of Nike, next please. You'll never learn how to do it, so just do it. It may be helpful. Thank you for your uh, time and attention. Oh, thank you for that excellent talk. And um, so coming to question, Anand, what could be the recommended case scenario of non drainage Yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, when you have a shallow fluid, you know, and uh, you have a break there and it's sitting well, and the elevation of the buckle itself takes you know almost all the fluid off then you have you run the risk of you know perforating the retina so that's the kind of situation where you would not uh, do uh, that at all that's one thing or a chronic rd whether it's the subliminal gland gliosis and uh, uh, you know again uh retina might settle slowly so you can perhaps do that I think uh, what uh, Ruthie was showing was the needle is in place for a long, long period of time. And under visualization, you're keeping draining through the hub of the needle or through the syringe. But uh, when I do a modified needle drainage, usually I'll just go in and come out. And then unlike in the cut, cut down, where you don't have to press because of chances of incarceration, in a small 26 gauge needle opening, the chances of incarceration are hardly any. So generally I push the subretinal fluid out from all those other locations to this location and then take it out till pigments starts coming and that's the end of the... Uh... Yeah, I think that's a, one good point which I'd also like to make is, uh, this is I mean, it was wonderful to see the uh, retina settling down. But buckling is a procedure which does not require a lot of uh, equipment. And I think uh, in the best interest of the nation, as a whole, I think we should, you know, push it both of that because we move from buckling to a buckling requiring with a microscope and a buckling requiring now a chandelier. So I think we should keep it, uh, you know, a simplistic technique. And, uh, you know, of course, it's lovely to see all this, uh, the retina setting down. But if you uh, localize the area that you need to drain from, 
simple needle drainage and then a little bit of pressure. And like you said, when pigments come uh, out, you know that you are a setting out. And also, I, 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 I would agree with that. And, and I think um, I learned some of the best techniques of uh, just actually using the same needle pass when I was at a VRSI meeting a few years ago. I, I think I showed the chandelier technique mainly as an educational tool. I think that it's very hard to demonstrate with indirect ophthalmoscopy, you know, the needle coming in uh, for the fellows. And unless they can actually see the end result or what should be happening, um, it's hard for them to understand the process. So I agree, opening a chandelier, it, it's, it's, uh, you're, you are spending some money to do that. But from a teaching standpoint, I think it's important for us to be able to demonstrate this is the effect and this is how to do it and then advance them to be able to do it on their own with um, either indirect or just externally. And uh, sure, I, agree, yeah. I think uh, localization also, and then again, drainage in the least vascular area near the mandal insertions and uh, those steps when we take. And traditionally, when you see pigments coming, we know that that is the end of the drainage. And Chandelier, yes, recent RCT trials also have shown that sometimes it has more complications like epidermal membrane formation because you are entering the procedure. So definitely the teach the way to buckle is actually again, um, you know, each step probably one or two cases is what we need to wash in with the pillow and then show each step. Yeah, and this is the only critical step where a subretinal hemorrhage can completely jeopardize. Yeah. So one more thing is if you have cryo, please avoid that area. Yeah. And if the break is very near to where you are planning to drain, then probably do the drainage first and then do the drying later. So, so just, uh, just a point, quick point I wanted to make was uh, that almost 80 to 90 percent of complications of scleral buckle happen because of draining. Yeah. So it's not always necessary to drain. As a matter of fact, in almost 80 to 90 percent of the cases, you don't need to drain. Another point that I was taught by uh, Dr. PDS and then, uh, you know, uh, reinforced by Dr. Kreisig was that you can leave if, if your buckle is right under the brake, you don't need to really make sure that there is a opposition. You can leave with a little bit of fluid and the next day everything will be settled. So we have to avoid that compulsion that, you know, the brake has to be on the buckle and there has to be perfect retinal opposition. You can still leave it without that and have a, a perfect success. So if your localization and your placing of your designer element is in place, I think we need not worry about complete drainage and seeing the retina attached. So I think we talked about a lot of complications and how to manage. I think no one other than Jatinder can tell us about how to manage the complications. Mm -hmm. The kind invite and thank you team VRSI for having me here. Um, it's nice to see you all in the physical area again. Um, so my presentation, as uh, Parmaja says, uh, that I can't, that I, nobody can do better than me. Not true. <laughs> so we agree that uh, once the patient has agreed to uh, undergo the retinal surgery, it's kind of a virtual contract to see each other uh, for the rest of the lives. So we have to manage the complications well, uh, which can happen intraoperative and postoperative. Uh, my job has been done much easier because of the previous presentations, and I'll. Uh, just touch upon a few of the complications. One of the most uh, uh, catastrophic complications uh, for a retinal surgeon can be a rectus disinsertion. Uh, there are certain risk factors and overzealous uh, put on the muscle sutures, especially by a beginner, can uh, is the most important factor here. Once the muscle has got disinserted, one important thing is do not retract to the opposite side in a hurry, hurry to uh, see the muscle and uh, pull it back again mm -hmm. in the eye in the primary position and use high elevation, high magnification, and if required, take the uh, uh, help of your pediatric optometrist. Uh, Slevel perforation, as we have all discussed, uh, the main factors are slevel thinning. If the slevel thinning is uh, very extensive, it's better to shift to the technique. Uh, if it is in patch area, you can skip those areas and uh, do the procedure in the remaining part. You can see this uh, uh, as the needle is being passed through. In the initial part, you can see the needle through it toward its track, uh, through the sphere. But then, last part, you can see the needle goes a little deep. And as you can see towards the end, uh, there is a fluid drainage uh, from that area. 
what you can do is easily uh, remove that question and put it right in posterior and that will be the job. So prevention has been already discussed. Um, so if the population is small, maintain the IOP and uh, uh, do the indirect ophthalmoscopy, see the examination site and manage accordingly. So the population is large as can happen with the sphere tunnel procedure. Sometimes you will like, we need to put a sphere patch graph there, uh, especially if this, uh, the thorough has got below. The subretinal hemorrhage, as we have discussed, is the most important complication and the most important factor which results into subretinal hemorrhage is the uh, hypotonic. If the pressure is main man managed well, if the eye is kept normal to height, uh, height uh, at the higher pressure, so usually the subretinal hemorrhage, even if it is occurred, can be very limited. Uh, I'm sorry if some videos are not playing here, uh, but this uh, video shows that as you, uh, as the needle is uh, used to perforate, possibly uh, subretinal fluid drainage, initial part uh, there is a dry tap and then suddenly there is a uh, lose of blood. So that is a warning sign that there is underlying subretinal hemorrhage. This is the, the post-op picture uh, because it was managed well, uh, it has remained a very localized hemorrhage. So prevention is the best thing. Uh, management is to increase the IOP, uh, suture the sclerotomy when needed and replace the drainage sites uh, imperially. Uh, in very rare cases, when I need to have a detectment. If the macula is not involved with the subretinal hemorrhage, you can just observe. And as you can see in this case, uh, the subretinal hemorrhage uh, dissolved with a good uh, outcome. Uh, this video again did not play, I'm sorry. Uh, subretinal extensive hemorrhage uh, technique was done. Multiple uh, infusion, multiple blood not only were made to, to inject uh, TPA. And once the blood was liquefied, the blood uh, was evacuated and uh, good outcome. Ended. The failure to reattach retina is another mm -hmm. thing that uh, most of us dread. Uh, most, most commonly it happens because of missed or immune break or inadequate uh, If there is persistent subretinal fluid in the center, you can just wait and watch uh, the OCT. If, the, if there is a peripheral detachment, you can do a pneumoretinal vaccine depending on the extent of fluid, and you can do a revision buckle. Uh, if it is inferiorly and you don't want to go in for vitrectomy, you can, if the fluid is uh, contained to the periphery, you can do a barrage laser as well. And pre surgery may be required uh, in some cases. Another complication is stage mouthing. This happens mostly because of a very broad uh, bubble and it can be easily uh, taken care of with a uh, radial element or uh, gas. Bubble suture related complications, even many years following the surgery, the patients can come back with complications like uh, infection, exclusion. And if it is managed well, the appendix which is removed and the buckle is removed, the cavity is uh, irrigated with antibiotics, it should do the job most uh, most of the times. Really, you need to go to the other quadrants and remove all the suture. Sympathetic oxapnea is one of the most dreaded complications. Uh, happens if uh, this, like most commonly I have seen uh, in my practice is because after the buckle has been removed and the chloride has removed, remain, uh, remained uh, uncovered. Uh, in those cases, uh, sympathetic ophthalmia is a real serious. Just uh, uh, to conclude, in general, uh, to uh, have a very uh, gratifying uh, end result, adhere to the surgical principles as illustrated by the previous speakers, identify the high risk characteristics. Prevention is the best thing. The second best is to early uh, recognize these complications early and then manage them properly. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jatinder. I think that was the first talk. So I think let us come back to the beginning. So we had a start of the session with the top tips in scleral buckling. So I would like to hear from vice counsel from each one of you, what, what will be your top tip for scleral buckling? I think uh, to begin with, uh, talked about doing the cryo and I think a very important point that do not remove that cryo probe prematurely. And when you're ready to remove it, make sure your assistant is dropping saline on the probe. And look at that probe, you should see the bare steel, you should see the eye caught out, and only then remove it. Do it doing it prematurely, you can even cause a scleral tear right there. That's very important. That like Not only see. scleral tear, you can see yeah. sometimes linear, small tears, new, new tears appearing. So that you should be thinking that it is actually happening due to your sudden. That's and also about you know learning the skills. I think I talk about uh, doing indirect observance very regularly. But also, uh, it would be good now that we have wet labs for all fellows to uh, you know, suture practice. 
because with the Svelu bucking, it's a science, but this is one place where it's also an art, it's an art component, and you have to get used to the wrist positions and holding the needle and how the needle has to be held. All those things have to be, uh, you know, understood. So all, there's a lot of background work which you need to do, and I can't overemphasize the uh, importance of getting used to wrist position maneuvering. Wrist position always pains, sir. Your topic. Any particular question, the fish mouthing can also occur if there is a localized detachment and a large retinal break which is posterior and you are close to brain, somewhere close to and if somebody drains in the region of the brain, you can have fish One more thing I like to fish mouthing is when you putting a broad band, uh, the suture points have to be at least one to two millimeters away. Very often what happens is the band is there and you are suturing right at the edge of the buckle. So the the, the, the suture is grabbing the buckle and that will cause inner, inner puckering and that will cause fish mouth. So when you do that, you have to release that suture, keep the margins uh, at least two millimeters ideally. If not, it's a very broad band, then at least one millimeter so that it, there's a smooth flattening. And if it's in the superior quadrants, you can put in an air bubble. So flat. Say a couple of tips. One is, uh, especially if uh, somebody is a novice who is basically going into a buckle and gets a subretinal hemorrhage, and if it's a uh, near lot of retinal detachment, the, the blood rapidly moves into the macular and it fits because the patient is lying supine. That's the most dependent area. So, unless you are adept in shifting over to metrectomy and you are immediately trying to you know, take blood out, finally the blood is still there. So, it may be better in that circumstance give the patient stop the surgery give the patient a position so that the blood goes to one of the peripheral retina or the inferior retina or something like that and then they take the patient up number two regarding the buckle height if you are if you are tying the buckle finally the uh, the buckle tightness is reached during hypotony if you are tightening the buckle the height is going to be very very high post and if you are uh, tying the buckle in a uh, you know, less hypotony or if, if the subretinal fluid has not come out like in a non drainage surgery, Abhishek was telling, then you will have to really tighten the buckle to get that effect there. So, that gauging is very important. And as Anand said, about two millimeter or three millimeters behind only, we have to place a posterior suture. And uh, uh, that depends on the so that buckle break relationship, the day post operative days, if it has to be nice, it is an art. Also, one more thing I'd just like to add, uh, Pradeep also mentioned this. I think it's very important, once you finish draining in the eyes in a hypotonal state, immediately, once you're ready to infuse the saline or your tamponade agent, make sure all four bridal vectors are immediately pulled. So you should get a perfect circular cornea. It shouldn't be your limbus, it shouldn't be oval. Perfect uh, circular cornea, so all four recti are equally pulled. That will prevent hypotonic, that will prevent your hemorrhaging, that will prevent your choroidals. And then, Calmly, go ahead and infuse the saline or the breast. Uh, my tip uh, was mainly for the uh, putting the suture. The needle, when we are, as you said very correctly, the wrist movement is very important. When you are placing the suture, make sure that the tip is seen all the time. If your tip disappears, disappears in the sclera, means you are going deep. So the tip has to be seen advancing in the sclera. You, you cannot lose that uh, tip. And very importantly on that very small, another fine tip on that or about the tip itself is that with the arc of needle for beginners, go only in small one millimeter things. Don't try to go in one shot. That's for, that's for experts. So go slowly and especially with thin sclera, always try to err on the side of superficiality rather than deep. So when you're going in, try to lift up slightly you know advance like this and keep going like that rather than going straight away yeah. Yeah. i think all of in all of us in sn here fondly remember one important instrument called kuchi johnson but to make sure that your uh, surface is uh, parallel so that you are able to you know pass the suture effectively so that has been the most important instrument and i make sure the fellow when they do first suture will be invariably done with the hand holding so that they, it is not passed at this thing so, Dr. Muthinja, your uh, top, top tips on the buckle before we go to... These are all great. I think the uh, most important is the pre-operative assessment. I think knowing what you're getting into before you go to surgery is critical. So, uh, a, a detailed 
drawing scleral depression and um, planning will make the difference uh, in your procedure. And uh, all the other points I agree with uh, wholeheartedly. Um, I think that even considering the scleral buckle comes from uh, identifying the pathology before you get into the operating room. I think um, we had any questions from the audience? Uh, Dr. Abhishek alluded to, he talks about using the slit of the microscope with the contact lens for doing scleral buckling. So that can help teach scleral buckling quite a bit. So any opinion uh, of the house about it? He uses the microscope and the Goldman 3 mirror almost exactly like you would use a 3 mirror on a slit lamp. And like you said, then you don't need an endo illuminator to be able to teach the residents because you're seeing everything uh, on the microscope camera. And uh, not only that, with the slit, you can actually make out the depth and, uh, you know, uh, much more information than you can uh, on a frontal view. Yeah. So I, this technique is probably used in Europe and Japan, but I don't know if anyone has seen it. Yeah, the whole point, the, his whole point is that, you know, if you're uh, putting a chandelier, you just converted an extraocular procedure into intraocular procedure. If you put the chandelier in a biome, you may as well go internally and, uh, you know, do the whole thing. And one other thing which I liked about his talks was, that he uses EPTFE uh, implant rather than a silicon implant. And he says it doesn't damage the sclera. But I've not been able to get it in India as yet. So any experience? So I think regarding the visualization, I feel that everyone should, we should proudly wear indirect ophthalmoscope on our heads and then do the fundus drawings. I think as a fellows, our head and everything used to burn initially because it used to take one hour. But now it will take a second to, you know, to 10 seconds to even to identify the break or cause it to break. So I think it's just in years of practice and practice of indirect ophthalmoscopy initial, at least in the fellowship time is the investment to learn the buckle art. And I'm sure this session uh, gave you some nuances and then the discussions can go on in the coffee breaks and in the upcoming. It should stimulate all of you to include this art tool in the argumentarium. Yes, sir. I think Madam Bonnet. In France, used that technique. Used to put a Goldman lens on operating microscope. This must be in the late 70s. We, we wish to see this tool, uh, this art in your armamentarium to manage effectively primary dermatogenic skin detachment. Yeah. So now moving on to two interesting three papers. And uh, first three paper is by Dr. Jinal Gori. She is going to talk about clinical features and outcomes of acute retinal necrosis, retinal detachment. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Padmasha. Very good morning, everyone. And I would like to thank the VRSI team for allowing me to present today. Uh, so, uh, to start with acute retinal necrosis, as we all know, is a rare viral infectious retinitis, uh, the positive agent being commonly herpes and varicella zoster virus. The incidence is ranging from 0.5 to 0.60 per, uh, per million per year. And uh, bilateral ARM is noted to be seen in 70% uh, of untreated eyes. So the incidence of retinal detachment in these cases ranges from 20 to 73%, which can occur in active phase or the phase of resolution. So in our clinics, we observed that a lot of patients presented with retinal detachment, like at presentation, they had RD uh, in cases of acute retinal necrosis. So we uh, took up the study to identify the clinical patterns anatomic outcomes, visual outcomes in patients uh, which have retinogenous retinal detachment at presentation with or without active retinitis. So it was a retrospective observational study of five-year duration and we included all patients of acute retinal necrosis with RDA presentation and the patient with inadequate documentation and follow-up were excluded. So all the patients underwent 23-gauge fast pain vitrectomy with encirclage and endotamponine. And outcome measures, a uh, uh, good visual outcome was when the best corrected visual acuity was more than uh, equal to 20 by, uh, 20 by 200 Snellen equivalent at three months post stop. And anatomic success was uh, retinal attachment at the final follow up. So the sample included 12 eyes of seven patients, all were males, and median age was uh, 36 years. Bilateral ARN was seen in five cases and unilateral in two. Uh, four patients among them were HIV positive and two of them were identified uh, at our clinic uh, on ocular examination. And uh, 
active retinitis was seen in seven eyes and the uh, patient with field retinitis was present in five. So uh, the duration of symptoms, mean duration was uh, 4.3 weeks and uh, median follow-up was eight months. Intraocular pressure noted in these eyes was normal to low, that is uh, mean of 11.66. Uh, in spite of it being a viral retinitis, which is noted uh, to have high intraocular pressures. So, uh, maximum patients had four quadrant retinitis, that is 59% followed by three quadrant, uh, two quadrant and one quadrant retinitis. Uh, the duration from presentation to OPD till surgery, uh, mean duration was 1.72 weeks. And the reasons for delaying surgery would be the presence of bilateral acute retinal necrosis, uh, where one eye was operated and the other eye awaited surgery, and diagnosed immunocompromised status, any socioeconomic reason, and unstable systemic status. So, all the, uh, the 11 eyes underwent surgery and one eye was excluded as it was inoperable. Active retinitis were given oral val acyclovir uh, or intravenous acyclovir. And also some patients were given intravitreal GAN cyclovir, uh, that is 7 eyes and uh, mean injections were 2.75. These were the uh, surgical details which were observed intraoperatively and additional surgery that the patient underwent was cataract surgery in 4 eyes and uh, the detachment was seen in 1 eye. Mean time to resolution of active retinitis was 23 days. For the anatomic outcomes, 10 eyes uh, had a median follow-up of 8 months and 1 eye was lost to follow-up. So primary uh, surgery success rate was 90% and 1 eye re-detached, which uh, underwent a re-surgery and it remained attached. Uh, 2 eyes had sequelae that is peripheral traction retinal detachment not involving macula and persistent peripapillary neosurgical detachment. For visual outcomes at 3 months, 70% uh, had good outcomes and 30% had poor outcomes. Uh, mean, uh, change in visual acuity uh, be, uh, from RD to treatment uh, was not uh, statistically significant but there was quite a uh, difference. And I would like to mention uh, this case that we saw, uh, it is uh, retinal detachment after resolution of ARN. Here we can see the temporally there and inferiorly there were atrophic retina and at the junction there were seen like breaks. Uh, in set in the OCT picture, we can identify the, uh, the RT clearly. Another patient uh, that we saw, this has act had active retinitis and this is the post-surgery picture where there is 360 degree active retinitis. So to conclude, retinitis retinal detachment could be often a presenting feature of ARN with either active or healed retinitis and prompt surgical management can give us good outcomes. Intraocular pressure may be normal to low. In most cases, despite viral retinitis, and individuals with HIV often have bilateral ARN with bilateral regardi nastarin. Thank you for your patient listening. Um, thank you, Jinal. I think it's a nice talk. And uh, Gopal, uh, we know that the PVD injection can be very challenging in these thin atrophic retinas and ARN, and also we met with many recurrences as well. So, what are your tips in PVD induction in cases of? Usually by the time retinal detachment occurs in an ARN, it will be a little later. PVD has already come in and it has moved to the peripheral area of retinitis and that is where it would, it would be. But I would not try to uh, remove the PVD from the area of retinitis. I would just stop short there. And uh, probably that is an area completely atrophic and probably adherent by that point of view. But one, one problem is usually a lot of retinal will be shortened. So that shortening will be there. And there will be a lot of, uh, uh, because of that shortening, the tear will be fairly going into giant retinal tear proportions by the time we end up uh, finishing the retract. Sometimes, not always, we see actually PVD occurring and one cortical layer of vitreous, mm -hmm. which will be kind of adherent and sometimes it might require even an yeah. ILM peeling to. Even move to the units of an empty retinal membrane, so the situation which will need to be So, Dr. Muthinja, any takes on this topic. Anand? Uh, I mean, uh, this is a very challenging situation. And uh, apart from, uh, you know, what uh, Gopal uh, said, you know, this is a case where you might want to even put in a broad band when there is a peripheral area instead of removing the vitreous. Because it, 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 you can very often get this layer of vitreous right there and it's a nightmare trying to remove that, when you try to remove that, you'll actually have a person in the situation you might have needs. So perhaps putting in a broadband at that point to settle them I and mean, just bring that up reduces the need to do that effect me. And also another challenge is where do you do the laser? 
for end of laser, you can do it like this. So you have to have a very mild, uh, uh, this is remember too hard, and keep uh, so that I'll never ma uh, laser right at the edge of that necrosis. There should be an area of healthy retina, and then do it there, because otherwise you can worsen the problem. And yeah, of course, you very often end up putting oil in these uh, places. And sometimes we may not remove the oil as well. 5000 cc so, so, so. and most would, of them can be one night. Yeah, I would very much like to know what is the cause of uh, uh, non improvement of vision in the three cases. Was it related to the retinal reattachment or was it AIOM or was it something else? Uh, so, Anna had a necrotic posterior retina, so uh, there was non, non improvement, and uh, two eyes uh, had developed cataract. So, uh, at, uh, at three months, uh, they had cataract, so it could not be, uh, the vision was less than 20 by 200. Thank you, Jinan. So we have our second free paper by Dr. Deepika Parmeshrappa. So she's going to talk about vitreoretinal surgical interventions in retinitis pigmentosa for non-retinal detachment in patients. Thank you, Dr. Parmesha. A very good morning, all. I'm Deepika. I shall be presenting on vitreoretinal surgical intervention in retinitis pigmentosa for non-retinal detachment indications. So RP is an inherited degeneration of photoreceptors and retinal pigment epithelium. We all know that patients present predominantly with night and peripheral vision problems and central vision whenever the macula gets involved. Said that there are various ocular association from anterior to posterior segment which add to the vision loss in these uh, patients. There are not many studies that mention about the management of vitreous and vitreomacular abnormalities in patients of RP. In one of our recent study, we, we found that uh, about 0.1 to 8.7% had some vitreous abnormality. It is uh, crucial to address the vitreous and macular abnormalities uh, as they hinder the only residual central island of vision in these uh, eyes. Hence, uh, this uh, study of uh, VR indications in RP eyes for non-retinal detachment. Uh, the purpose was to understand the non-retinal detachment indications and usefulness of VR surgeries in these eyes to assess the improvement in central visual acuity post uh, VR surgery. It is a retrospective study of eight years duration we included all the RPIs with vitreous macula or any other abnormalities for which they had undergone VR surgery. Uh, excluded with uh, post-trauma eyes, previous history of VR surgeries, any conditions mimicking RP. We also excluded retinal detachment of any kind because uh, our group itself had worked on RD in RP a uh, few years. Retinitis pigmentosa was uh, diagnosed as per the standard uh, criteria. Moving to the results, there were 44 eyes of 40 patients. Median age was 54 years, 70% of them were males. 43%, uh, nearly half of them, presented with diminished vision of recent onset. So I had defined the recent onset as 1, 1 to 1 year with or without floaters. Mean BCVA in Logmar was 1.30. So these are the major vitreoretinal surgery indications which we found out. Uh, we can see that the major part is contributed by vitreous opacities, that is 43% of them had vitreous opacities. Next was 25% with uh, the natural lens abnormalities, that is subluxated or dislocated cataractus lenses. It was followed by the intraocular lens abnormalities along with the capsular bag abnormalities and uh, macula hole, uh, the rest is vitreomacular abnormalities. Uh, directly moving to the BCVA comparison pre and post surgery, this is for the overall uh, cases. What we can see here, th there is a post of BCVA improvement, which was statistically significant, and 77% of the eyes had improvement in vision, but 23% of the eyes showed no improvement. 68% of the eyes had subjective improvement. So, how did we assess the subjective improvement? Was we pulled out all the files where the physician had mentioned that patient is feeling better or uh, yes, uh, the floaters have reduced. This, uh, I'll be showing few cases also. Case one is a left eye, patient is having 20, 100 vision. We can see that there is dense vitreous membranes and there is no retinal detachment confirmed by B-scan and post left eye PPV, the vision was improved to 20, 40. Uh, this case two is uh, another patient with right eye 20, 160 vision, vitreous opacity we can see in the inferior quadrant of the retina in fundus picture. But if we look at the B scan, we see that the vitreous opacity is there in all the quadrants and it was mobile. So probably it will also come in the center of the uh, macula. Post PPV, the vision improved to 2080. So as the vitreous opacity was the major part contributing for the indications, I tried to analyze uh, the BCVA improvement post and pre. 
uh, there was only marginal improvement and it was not significant but what important point we got was four out of five patients with bilateral vitreous opacities had undergone second eye surgery with one patient opting for the second eye surgery within four days of the first eye. So this can infer that definitely they had subjective improvement in the first eye. Uh, that's why they opted for the second eye. Uh, this is a last case, case three, a, three, a 36 year old male with decreased vision of four months duration, uh, posterior subcapsular cataract, full thickness macular hole with RP background. Patient underwent sequential surgery. The pre-op visual acuity was 20, 1200. Post cataract surgery, the vision was 2400. And post macular hole surgery, we are seeing the macular hole is closed with the vision of 2125. So this is the table showing vitreomacular abnormalities. Uh, to highlight in the macular hole part, the success rate is about 50 or less than 50. What we are seeing more is whenever the eyes had type 1 closure, they had some improvement in the vision. We did not have any uh, major complication in this set of eyes, but one eye developed retinal detachment post non-closure of the macular hole. The strength is it provides insights into usefulness. Limitation is that it is a retrospective study and we do not have all the baseline and follow-up imaging modalities. Uh, to conclude, uh, the major VR surgical indications in these eyes were vitreous opacities and subluxated dislocated lens or intraocular lens. This, by this study, we are not recommending vitreous opacities to be removed in all RPS. But what we can think is, if an RP patient is presenting in the late middle age, with a duration of less than one year, can benefit with VR surgery, leading to central visual acuity and subjective improvement. Uh, we also can infer that RPI is tolerated VR surgery reasonably good without major complication. Said all this, preoperative counseling is very crucial to avoid high expectation post surgery in these size. Especially persistence of photophobia and photopsia, which happen due to central core involvement, which will be there in the same duration of the age that is uh, in the later stages, about 35 to 60 years. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I think thank you, Deepika, for the talk. I think definitely uh, one interesting finding, probably, which will uh, definitely introduce a debate that uh, an interesting finding is that the four or five patients with bilateral vitreous opacities who came with recent. Uh, they definitely opted for second eye surgery feeling the improvement and definitely i know that this is the indication not only rp patients many patients come for us with the protest and we kind of uh, we generally don't immediately don't do but what is your take anyone has an experience and what is your take on surgery for vitreous opacity for rp patients Opa? Um, I have not done many uh, vitreous statistics for our patients. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, everybody in the audience, please feel free to share experience. But then, yes, uh, I was actually surprised to see the very high concentration. And when she put forth this topic, I thought it would be removing epiretinal membranes, which, of course, have done a few. Yeah, pollen eye was all yeah, right. Yeah, pollen eye was, I think, because yeah. they'll have that inherent yeah. uh, zonular so weakness. Week back. Yeah. So I was, uh, you know, so frankly surprised to see that such a high percentage of vitreous opacities. Uh, I was thinking that, you know, maybe a lot of kids have asteroid hyaluronic or something like that. Uh, but then I, these patients are, I mean, it, one has to face the fact that they are clutching at straws. So if you're reporting that you've improved them from 20 by 80 to 20 by 40, that's that's a tangible improvement. I think you need to be congratulated for putting this uh, forth. These and are all low vision patients who actually perceive that little bit of improvement a significant improvement also probably. yeah so the perception also matters see traditionally i think with 20 gauge and all we were definitely hesitant to go inside and definitely even with the sutureless also it says that the vitrectomy is a you know easier technique but at the same time are we not offering them is something we need to think about it probably a much more randomized kind of a trial should be there as a follow-up study it would be interesting to do to see if you've uh, done uh, electrophysiology ergs for these patients that are post vitrectomy since you've done a large number yes to see if that improves if the retinal function is also improving because it's changed from a vitreous milieu to an artificial to a saline uh, milieu and i don't think there's much information there so uh, i was actually wondering whether when you're doing so much of vitrectomy are we actually you know in some way harming the you know, the photoreceptors, which are already compromised yes. while you're subjecting them to detect me, pressures rising, you know, 40 minutes of surgery, whatever. Yes. So it, it would be a good idea to just look at, you know, whether there's, there's a functional improvement from my electrophysiology. And not to forget thing. about the phototoxicity. Correct, that absolutely. Can... Yeah, yes. Yes. Like, yes. exactly. Yeah. Uh, this has nothing to do with vitreous opacities. No.
Yeah, it's working. <laughs> that was a very nice talk. My comment has nothing to do with vitreous opacities, but in operating cases for vitreomacular pathology in document with documented pro uh, progression in eyes with inherited retinal dystrophies. You do get a very satisfactory anatomical and Snellens, uh, say, improvement in the early stage. But later on, if you were to compare with the other eye, because two of my patients, it was only one eye which had the problem. You see the progression of the disease is much more in the eye which has had the surgery. In terms of inner retinal thick thinning, I've seen that in star guts, I've seen that in RP. So just a word of caution, though technically you get early response. When you follow those patients down the years, you will find central changes more progressive in the eye that you've operated. That is excellent, wise the comment and uh, one thing to ponder upon. Patient, uh, what so those opacities? Do you have any idea about or figure of how much was the how, how follow up? Yeah. Yeah, follow up duration uh, median was uh, 23, 23 months. So we do not have the longer follow up. But definitely one of our I had foveal thinning of uh, uh, ERM patient. I think VMT VMT patient had foveal thinning. So we have, yeah, we have six minutes and uh, we had, uh, you know, talk about scleral buckling started with and then AR and related data, two fee papers about AR and related and also the RP indications. Audience, do you have any questions? Yeah. So just to, uh, you know, push this forth, we've been talking about buckle or vitrectomy. I think there's also a very crucial role of buckle and vitrectomy. So, you know, buckle supplementing, aiding, augmenting your vitrectomy and uh, traditionally uh, encircling bands have been put at least in Arvind. We do it, uh, have been doing it for cases of vasculitis, you know, or trauma, uh, where, you know, supporting element helps in long-term outcomes, you know? especially, and especially also it may reduce the need of extensive uh, retinectomy also, when you're able to remove a significant amount of the PBR, anterior PBR. Absolutely. So we are extremely thankful uh, to Dr. Pitri. Yeah, one second. Yeah. I just want to ask uh, the house, the whole house now. Uh, we have a total retinal detachment, no PVR, maybe a couple of breaks superiorly. How many of you will prefer uh, vitrectomy? How many of you will prefer buckle? So first of all, let us ask about Fakic buckle. or pseudo um, um, Yeah, let's let's take first the fakic and then the pseudo -fakic. Okay, so first is fakic. Total retinal detachment, two tires superiorly, no PVR. How many will go? I mean, he's a 60 year old man. How many will uh, go for buckle? Wow. So we have been successful. <laughs> okay. And uh, if it is pseudo faking, how many will go for buckle? All right. Okay. So we so thank you. Oh, sir, there is one question. Uh, sir, in combined surgery, when we combine uh, encircles buckle with PPV, Sir, when is the best time to uh, tighten the buckle? Like after finishing the vitrectomy or after fluid air exchange? After fluid air exchange. Okay, so in that case, sir, I also become little soft. So always clamp the infusion. Uh, yeah, your, the pressure is in your hands. Doing vitrectomy, air is infusing in. Okay. So and I think you're talking here, about combined, right? So that the, is obviously a yeah, coming with you. Yeah, the idea is not to provide a very high intent. It's just a support. So I think your tightness can be very, I mean, yeah, it need yeah. not be tight at all. He's not asking about the degree. He's asking when to do that tightening. So that oh, is. Yeah. And uh, like, uh, sir, if the ports are a little leaky, so after fluid direct exchange, if the eye becomes soft, uh, sometimes like we over indent also. So uh, my question was in that regard. No, no, you can suture your ports. No once you have opened. Once you have opened the conjunctiva, you anyway putting sutures. There shouldn't be any, it's a, there shouldn't be any doubt or hesitation about uh, suturing your ports. You're putting so many sutures for conjunctiva, right? Yes. Just one small little bite. Absolutely no doubt there. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. So we thank. So we thank. Uh... But sir, we when we do PPV, we can always like uh, do drainage from inside. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. 
so kashi will tell thank you sir. definitely over coffee so thank you uh, thank you dr mutinjia for joining us online and we are extremely uh, delighted and honored to have presence and any are you online yeah. okay so <clears throat> thank you everyone and uh, i think thank you dr mahesh anmugam and divyansh uh, for and scientific committee and team vrsi to include sterile buckling as the first session of vrsi and i'm sure all of you will are uh, you know enthusiastic in the learners as well as elders everyone will practice this art to have the designer element in place and to have safe effective way of so it is an art and it is an embroidery so let us practice it thank you Thank <laughs> you.